Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. My name is Corey, and I am sitting at Premier Orlando. Mr. Tony is all the way in Iceland today, so uh, I've, I've made this request uh, for about a month now. But uh, whenever you, uh, if you can DM, text, email Tony, tell him he sucks for not being here. But we're gonna have a great, great time without him. Hey, so um, Tony's not here. So what we've decided to do is that we're just gonna do a bunch of roundtable conversations with some new friends, some old friends, some friend, friend, friends, and we're just gonna um, we're just gonna chat it up, and then uh, we'll kind of see uh, where it's gonna go. Today, sitting with me is. Our good buddy Robert Lawrence from the Hairdresser Show Strong. Oh, the Hairdresser Strong Show. I'm gonna mess it up. <laughs> the Hairdresser Strong Show. Um, he sat in with a couple of us, and we also have our dear friend Mr. Hair by Hunty. Uh, definitely give both of them a follow. And uh, and and our spotlight queen of the day is. Oh, wrong one. Oh, Which one was it? there it is. Yeah. Uh, Say it one more time for me, please. Okay. So we have the amazing Ashley Norman at the table. And, uh, you know, we're just going to be a bunch of four friends cutting it up like we would, like if we were on an episode of Friends. How's that sound? Good. Let's get it popping. Sounds amazing. Let's get it, let's get it popping. So, um, okay, so uh, Rachel or Monica? I already told you. I am totally a Monica because she's the smart one. That, I, see, I, I, I kind of <laughs> go like, really? I mean, like, I, I wasn't sure if that was like Jennifer Aniston hate or if that was Rachel. No, 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 no. Je I mean, listen, Jennifer Aniston has aged better than uh -huh. Courtney Cox. So if we were going for looks, yes, of course, you know. Got Rachel, it. But All right, Hunty. What's this here? Rachel, probably. You're a Rachel? Yeah, but I'm full honesty here. Like, I'm too young. <laughs> oh, we're talking about shame now, <laughs> no. no, you did. I just like I only like just missed it. Like I wasn't a part of that era, unfortunately, because like Jennifer's a queen. But mm. <laughs> yeah, he's just too young for us. So oh, I think we're gonna have to leave now. I think he's got to leave now. Actually, <laughs> I think we're kicking him out. So of the sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, Robbie. Uh, I guess Courtney. I would have to go with Courtney as well. I mean, I was going to go with Joey, but you can go with I Courtney. was going to go with Joey, yeah. But okay. I thought we were picking between Courtney and... No, no, we're talking about the whole Courtney cast. Coxon. Oh, okay. Then Joey, yeah. You're going with Joey. But I, I mean, if you want Joey, I'll take Chandler. I mean, I, I'll take Joey. Okay. I'll take Ross. I don't want Ross. I don't want Ross. But then if I take <laughs> Ross, then... Hunty, you and I did it. Did it happen? Were you we on a break or what? <laughs> He's and, too young to get and, it. Yeah, and and how many sorry. breaks? <laughs> pivot, 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 pivot. <laughs> um, why is that so funny? Still, every time. I know, and I have a whole technique called the jump and pivot, and that's still a good one to use in class. Yeah. What's the jump? For the and pivot? older folks in the room. For the older, pro yeah. <laughs> pivot, pivot. Look, he. He he opened up to throw shade, and he's just gonna get like dumped yeah, on this uh, entire time. I'll take it. I deserve it. <laughs> he's with the TikTok cool kids. You know what he, I'm saying? Um, like he is yeah. with the TikTok cool kids. Yeah. TikTok girl here. Very much <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, Ash, are you doing the tick? The TikTok? The TikToks? Uh, I mean, I have one, but mm -hmm. I I need to be more active on it. So I'm gonna get there. Maybe you can put me on game. No, like I'm actually I'm not a good poster at all on there. I feel mm -hmm. like TikTok's a great escape for me. From all of like the normal hair stuff. As like, a consumer or as, as a, a consumer, yeah. yeah. Um, as an educator, I still have not done a good job at like showing up consistently, but mm -hmm. it's definitely like I feel like it's one of those things that's like inevitable. Like you have to show up on there in one way or another eventually. I think I can't I can't figure it out at all. I'm gonna be honest. You know, like 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 I mean, even my, even our Instagram engagement isn't like super awesome, mm -hmm. but but to go to TikTok it's like completely, completely dead. And it's I think a different that, game. And not only that, but I think like it our Instagram game is for hairstylists, you know, and then TikTok's for everyone. And I don't know if there's enough hairstylists that are playing in that world that care that much, you know, but, but to your point, like my consumption on TikTok is like a break. Mm -hmm. My consumption on Instagram is like, it becomes work, Yep. you know, and it's, it's not, and, and, and 
when I first got on a few years ago, it was a lot of fun to hang out on Instagram. It's no longer fun to me. And not that it's not, not that it's bad by any means, but it's just not where I go to escape. Yep. Where I go to escape is TikTok. And I think TikTok has done a really marvelous job of um, their algorithm is, is bringing in exactly what I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. You know, not what I'm trying to put out, but what I'm interested in. So it, it, that's a little bit different too. Yeah. Their algorithm formula is insane. Like I'll be like thinking about something and then all of a sudden I'll be <laughs> scrolling and I see exactly what I was thinking about. It's wild. I only <laughs> scroll and see things that I, I like. It is wild. It is crazy. Yeah. It? It's wild. It's like a billion dollar algorithm. <laughs> it's crazy. It certainly is, right? Mm-hmm. Well, they're also like I, I I'm not gonna make it controversial, but <laughs> like if you if you read the user yes. like thing, it's like it's it's scary. It is scary. Because they're like yeah. in your phone, they're in your email, yep. they're in your text, they're in your whatever. Yep. You yeah. know? the era we live in it's yeah. the era is that what we're going with like there's no like there's no accountability to it it's just like this is where we are or just don't have anything that you need to hide <laughs> but, but, just, but listen I, I am sure you're husband... all laughing over here like <laughs> 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 but your husband's right here i'm sure you don't want your like uh conversations being algorithm um i mean we don't really dirty text. That's not a thing. With no, I don't mean that. I just, I mean, even like, you know, like, like whatever, you know? Well, you also got to think though, I'm on, on the road a lot and I'm traveling and teaching. And, you know, when it comes to social media, I'm not always the one who's posting. I post on my main feed and I do all my own DMs. But when it comes to the story, I have a lot of help with that. So sure. during the day of the class, we're teaching like a 12 hour day and it's really 18 hours by the time you go from the time we get up to the back time we get back to the hotel. Sure. And so I can't be also posting and keeping up with my stories at the same time that I'm educating. So I'll pass that task off. And so a lot of times I've got, you know, a lot of people in my phones anyway. So there's not a lot of privacy in my life just in general. Right. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. What, what do you consume? What do you mean consume wise? Uh, like we watch, like I go to TikTok like when I'm shutting down. Oh, right? yeah. Like Instagram to yeah. me again is kind of like, uh, I've got to do this, you yeah. know. But, but, um, yeah. but for TikTok. fun, for like pleasure, yeah, for yeah, just, for, just for Ashley, mm. you know, not Ashley the artist, but just Ashley the person that's what, laying in their what bed. What is that entertainment? What, like what free time? Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, she does have 12 kids, a husband, yeah, a full time yeah. job, educator, works for a bunch of brands. <laughs> yeah, I have three small children. And so when I'm home, yeah, no, there is no consumption of even anything that I enjoy. So, but you know, I enjoy my kids. So when I come home, right. it's like, when I haven't seen them, it's, I just, it's, and so it's kind of interesting because there is like mom guilt about traveling, but at the same time, like when I'm home, I am very present because I miss the shit out of them. So when I see them, we're just like, oh, like, how was your day? What's going on? And like, so we're very involved. And so especially bedtime, it's like, you know, brush the teeth, read the stories, like listen to the special song and mommy, come sleep with me. No, come sleep with me. No, come sleep with me. So then it's just like, ah, and then the husband's like, Hey, and you're just like, Oh God. How <laughs> <laughs> you doing? Joey. I'm like, How hold on. Doing? Let me go get my, uh, let me go get the lingerie on. Hold up. I'll be right back. Yeah. So there is no time for like consuming for enjoyment, but I do enjoy the process of creating the, of creating the actual content. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy like, obviously engaging with my community. So I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, it, it is another job and people do get burned out on it. And they ask me like, how do you not get burned out? And how do you this? And how do you that? And I think the biggest thing, it has to be a source of joy because if it's not, that's when it's going to like, so the minute it's like, oh, I'm Hello. posting and I'm not enjoying it, that's when I have to take a break. And sometimes I do. I don't post every day. Like I'll go like if, you know, three days, four days, even a week sometimes not posting. But, you know, if I'm creating the content and I'm enjoying the creative part of it, so either in class or with a collaboration and I'm working with my team and they're helping me take the footage, then when I'm editing it, it's like it's fun because I'm looking at it I'm like, remembering the day of it rather than it being about like trying to get the pictures of the clients. So that's something I did early on um, after I really started doing a lot of this influencer thing is I wasn't doing so much of my content off of my behind the chair and I was doing it separately in these collaborative like photo shoot type things and that way I could batch my content and have it more be about a fun experience that I could relive through posting it. Rather than having it being like, oh, I'm trying to get this photo with this client and yeah. 
I remember like doing balayages and then, you know, it would get dark and I'd have them come back the next day at like 6 a.m. so I could blow dry their hair and get a photo in natural light. And like, you know, I put in that work, That's work. in the yeah. beginning. Like you have to, you have to like hustle hard for it. And I, not to say that I'm not hustling hard for it, but now that I've learned that, hey, I can go off and do these little batched content shoots and then relive it through the actual editing and the posting and then the, the communication through my community online, it's more enjoyable for me. And then I can be more present either with a client or with my, my family. Yeah. That's the awesome. everyday hairdresser can do that too, you know? I mean, like, even if um, even if you, like, take, like, three models in a day and then you just, like, change out their, like, jackets, oh, right? Yeah. Or, like, just take a bunch of different angles and pictures and videos. Like, you can make a lot of uh, content. I love that idea yeah. so much for people. Yeah, yeah. It's – especially when you're a parent. Like, it's – Oh, my gosh. It's so hard. And that's the thing is, like, people say, like, oh, it's another job and it's a love-hate relationship. Well, yeah, it is another job because you're marketing your brand. Yep. And b before social media, you had to work for the brand. And so you really wanted to work at a salon that already had a reputation because that was how you were going to build your clientele. Sure. And location mattered. So you wanted to work in a good location that had access to walk-ins. You wanted to work at a salon that had a name and a reputation within the industry. And they were the ones who fed you either walk-ins or just new clients coming into the salon group. Let's say Carlton International, for example. And so that was the way to do it. But then think about it. Like that salon is the one who had the front desk and booked the clients. And they were the ones who brought in the education. And they are the ones who had the – who – built the website and they marketed their brand. So you got paid a little bit less because mm -hmm. you're yeah. getting a smaller commission. So now fast forward, a lot of us are in our booth renters and now we are everything. We are the front desk. We book our own appointments. We check our clients out. We do the retail. We have to market our own brand, but then we get paid more. Yep. So because we get to keep more of our income, we can take less clients behind the chair and spend more time on the marketing piece. So I do think it's important to schedule in that time and not work 50 hours behind the chair trying to just get clients in and out. Because if you can work maybe for example, I was working three days a week. I like to work Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays when I had my first child because I liked one day on, one day off, especially when I was still breastfeeding. So I had Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays off so I could be with my kid those three days of the week. And I actually made more money working three days a week and spending more time on the side doing the content because my brand value was higher. So I had fewer clients at a higher price point. So it's worth doing it, but you have to make time separate from your behind the chair work and you have to enjoy it. So that's why I was saying like, you're, like you're saying, like any hairstylist can do this. And, and I did, like I started these collaborations like by myself and then I started working with just, you know, like-minded artists and friends. For example, I did um, a collaboration with Karis Mills. And Karis Mills was one of my hair heroes back in the day. I used to travel up to San Francisco. There was this academy called Petro Todd. And I would go up there like every single year for about a decade and take these continuing education classes. And she was one of the lead educators for them. 10 years later, when I started to grow on social media, she was in a, in a uh, meeting with Matrix, who she was working with at the time. And they're like, hey, guess what? Like, I remember you coming into to DePetro Todd and I just saw your imagery come up on the slideshow of like who to watch. And so it was a trip because this person that I had looked up to is now seeing my work and is like, oh, they're telling me like you're the trendsetter. How cool is that? We should do a collaboration sometime. That's cool. And I was like, oh, my God, that would be an honor. That's so cool. So long story short, she came and I had at that time 130 square foot studio it was a salon sola. And so it was me and then my client who happened to do makeup for fun on the side. So the three of us got, to, got together and we did this collaboration on my uh, makeup artist neighbor. And it was this really pretty cute like little shag with this like really rich chocolate or like not chocolate, a more of an auburn red color. And anyway, that photo has like since completely blown up. It's still all over Pinterest and everything. And then it got nominated for a BTC one shot. And we were like, what? Like, how cool is this? And so we actually attended the show and that was um, back in 2021. And we didn't think anything of it. We were just like literally happy to be there. Sure enough, we won that year. Wow. And so we got up and we were just, I mean, we were like, <laughs> <laughs> like crying, like just like, out of our minds. It was also something that meant a lot to me too, because 
prior to working with this collaboration team, I was in a salon and I had been the network educator for Bumble and Bumble. So that's how I started in education. I was an educator with Bumble and I used to fly to New York and take these classes and it was a liaison type program where I'd go take the classes and then do teachbacks. And then I ran the assistant program, a whole salon education. And so I built this whole team and then I ended up leaving that salon. And so it was really hard for me because I had left a salon family and I was really scared to go into a booth or, um, sorry, a suite because I was, I was kind of worried about just being alone. And I also wasn't sure I had so much of my identity wrapped up in that salon that I wasn't sure if I had left that I would just kind of be nobody after that because I wasn't sure if my success was, you know, a result of them or they, their success was a result, result of mine. So looking back, Thank God (laughs) it was the other way. But um, so anyway, going out into renting a salon suite and being a part-time working mom, it was such a scary transition while I was also still trying to continue to grow as an independent traveling educator and that we were able to do that. And then also win a one shot was so rewarding. Fast forward the next year or two after that, I can't remember, Yvette, the makeup artist, you might know her on Instagram as Moivette. um, She was doing Mary behind the chairs makeup all weekend. So now she's like Mary's makeup artist and she, so it's just incredible because you just really never know. And I think you, you look at these people and you just like think, oh, well that's them. And it's like, yeah, but we all started out at the same level. Like, I want you to say it again because that's so important. Like we, like, like everybody that is somebody was nobody, I put it in quotations, you know, at some point. And, 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 and it was, and I think I've had this conversation a few times on the podcast and, and, and what concerns me is, is we're seeing a lot of stuff about like hustle culture being toxic, but I'm so mm-hmm. scared that if you're not in the hustle, you're You're just going to, you're going to get, you're going to get left behind. You know, it's, it's like, the, what's the old saying? Like talent, talent takes you so far and then work takes you the rest or something. You know, like, like I'm so scared that no matter how talented you are, if you're not in the hustle, if you're not in the game, honestly, if you're not in the rooms, everything happens in the rooms. You know, all relationships that, that happen, happen in those, in those rooms. And if you're not hustling to get into those rooms, I just don't, you know, if you want, you're, if you want to sit on a stage or something, it, that, that space just, I don't know if that space is going to be there if, if you're seeing hustle is toxic. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting. I actually did a class yesterday. And on it, hustle is toxic? Kind of. Yes, uh-huh. actually. It was, it was entitled, um, old, oh, it's, it's when, um, when the premiere approached me about attending this year. They asked me what I wanted to teach. And I was like, okay, well, I want to do, you know, my haircut, butterfly, Bixie and Wolf. And I want to do my balayage versus foilage. And, and then Kate Teen booked me for a separate class, but I'm like, but I also want to teach on mental health and social media. And I didn't, I just kind of threw it out there. I didn't think that they would say yes. Cause I don't, I mean, listen, I'm not a licensed therapist. Right. right. But you know, you don't get to a quarter million followers and not go through some shit. Right. So you know, it's part of my story that I feel like I've shared in my in-person classes and people resonate with it. And so I'm like, I think I, this is something that I want to share on a bigger platform. And they were like really excited about the topic. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I was like, oh no, now I Now you got to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So I was like, ever since they agreed to it, I've been like thinking about it, praying about it, and then working on with my husband and going back and forth and everything that we've been through. I mean, we're high school sweethearts. So we've been together for, we started dating in 2000. So 23 years we've been together. Um, We got married in 2006. So I don't know how many years married, Whatever. three kids. Like we've gone through a lot of marriage counseling and we've processed a lot together and we've built this foundation and this business. And um, you know, we kind of brought a lot together of, of what we've processed. And so one of the things that we talked about is like, you just said is like, okay, when, before you were somebody, you were nobody or whatever. And in the salon that I had worked at and I had built up and I had wanted to be the salon partner and ended up getting turned down for that. And then the person who was the most social media famous person at the time ended up getting that partnership position. So what I compare it to is like, there was these two hierarchies and the first hierarchy, you, you gained validation and you gained status through your skill level and your education level. And you climbed the ladder of the brand. So if I wanted to be a platform artist, let's say for example, for Vidal Sassoon, like I had to go through the ranks of the Sassoon Academy and be tested out and be vetted into that system. Well, all these people who climbed this old ladder, who were the people in the top platforms, they got completely toppled when social media came out. So now this new hierarchy has made the old hierarchy completely irrelevant. And it 
was really hard for a lot of us who spent, you know, the first decade of their career within the older hierarchy because we climbed this ladder that's now fallen over. And we're like, holy shit. There's no ladder. (laughs) Yeah. So now there is positive things, obviously, about the new hierarchy. And that for me is the fact that it gave someone who is a part-time working mom a global platform. So, you know, before I would have had to have lived in, you know, LA, like within Beverly Hills, for example, or I had to be in New York or Paris, Milan, like one of the fashion cities. I had to work for a Sassoon or a Tony and Guy or a Bumble and Bumble. So location mattered. And also I would have had to compete with a lot of maybe non-parents that don't have to work one day on one day off and can go every hard every single weekend. So now, you know, the, the thing about social media is it's given a voice to the people that were previously underrepresented. So, for example, moms or other parents that are living in the suburbs, in the safety of the suburbs, right? So in that sense, like, here I am as a platform artist, whereas in the old hierarchy, there's no way I been, would have been able to climb that and still have been able to, you know, have the, the family dream that I have. So there is a give and take there with the two hierarchies. That being said... Anyone can call themselves an educator. So there's no vetting. And so sometimes, you know, someone might be a great stylist, but that doesn't mean they're a great teacher because those are completely two different skill sets. Or maybe they're not even that great at doing hair, but they were just an early adapter to technology. So that's the only thing. But doesn't, but doesn't, with with that being said, doesn't, doesn't the cream always rise? Like, I think, like, I think, like, I think, like, certainly, certainly post COVID, I think everybody's calling themselves a coach now, right? Like what was an educator before COVID is now a coach now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think where we are currently as we sit in this, as we sit in these chairs is I think we're figuring out who the cream is. Right. Like yeah. there's a lot of coaches yes. out there, but, yeah. but I think you're going to see, you know, the, the few rise. In and that. that's, and that's honestly exactly what's happening. And so I'm kind of seeing now like a hybrid of the generations, like a new hierarchy building. And this is really what I wanted to, to speak on in my class was like, you know, I think a lot of times like we get this whole like, oh, imposter syndrome, like it couldn't be me. Like there's like, it's, that's, that's you, but that's never going to be me. Or, you know, it's okay if you want to just be a great hairstylist behind the chair, but at the same time, If you're sitting back and you're looking at the people who are at the top and maybe they are earlier adopters of technology, maybe you feel like they don't deserve that spot or maybe you feel that they're toxic and that they're a negative impact on the industry. If you're looking at the leadership today and you're not happy about it, but you're also not giving yourself out there as an alternative, now it's not even about your insecurity. It's about your responsibility. If you're Mm. abdicating, guess what? That's you're now becoming a part of that problem. So that's what I say about social media too. Like, I feel like I have a responsibility to be out here and representing for the moms and saying, hey, guess what? It's okay to work one day on and one day off. And it's okay if you, hey, if you want to travel, you know, if you can afford to have, like, I, for example, I traveled with my mother-in-law for five years and she was my nanny. So I could bring my infant along and breastfeed exclusively through a full year and, Now I'm at the point where I've actually also retired my husband and, you know, he did the first six months with our third baby and now, you know, him and my mother-in-law trade off being home with the three kids. And so it's like, hey, listen, you can do this and it looks a little different and it is a lot of hard work because it is grassroots, but it's possible and you can do it on your terms and then you can also inspire change in the industry. Like even something as simple as like I was in Germany for Schwarzkopf International and we're there doing um, the color crafters thing where we had all of these different influencers from around the world coming together to create content and I was still pumping at the time and they didn't have a space for me. And I'm like, hey, you guys need a pumping room. Like the industry is how many percentage women and how many percentage mothers and you don't have a pumping room. Like, so there's things that we need to think about in this industry is like, you know, in a salon, even there should be an environment that's comfortable for that for women rather than them having to run to their car and (laughs) put the shades up like I used to. So there's just like conversations that happen when you put yourself out there. Hey, listen, if you're not happy with leadership, then put yourself as a potential leader. Is it going to take a little bit more work? Are you going to have to take on some responsibility? Yes. But it's not about your ego because, listen, the beauty industry is a service industry and your online community is people that you actually serve. So you have to look at them as your clients. That's your clientele. Your fan base is your clientele. If you look at the best, like famous people, you see the way they treat their fans. You know, the people that treat their fans the best, they're the ones that go the farthest because they understand that's why they have a job. It's because of those people that they're serving. And whether it's entertainment, inspiration, or education, it's all the same thing. 
I'm glad it's Sunday because I feel like I'm at church. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a question. Uh, so this, I love everything you just said. Uh, I, I I find that some of the essence of what I'm I'm hearing uh, kind of creates a um, uh, conflict with the young up and coming stylists. Like a lot of the times, and I talk like I work with a lot of uh, young rising stylists. I go to the schools, and mm-hmm. uh, a lot of salon owners will call me and ask me about like you know how you know this what's the generational differences and mm-hmm. uh and like after digging into that topic it what it looks like is that you have a lot of students in school on their mm-hmm. phones mm-hmm. learning about the industry before they've even stepped foot mm-hmm. into the industry i mean outside of being out of school and yes. uh and they're doing like one or two clients a day. Uh, a lot of value proposition from the schools is that, uh, hey, you just need a license. You're a hairdresser. And then you can, you know, every all the stuff that you're saying, it's like on your terms, et cetera. But when they walk into a salon, that that reality kind of isn't isn't what they're experiencing. Mm-hmm. And they're not experiencing that you they can set the terms. Like salon owners are like, well, I'm not going to give you a client until you go through some training to make sure that you, I, you're not going to cause me to get bad reviews. And, and then this, and a lot of these kids go out on their own straight into a suite. And mm-hmm. I'm not hearing a ton of success there. I'm hearing, I'm hearing like a pretty bad churn rate from these up and coming mm-hmm. stylists. So could you speak to like, the students, and also to the salon owners that have got these kids coming into their mm-hmm. salons? Yeah, I love this question. So I travel and teach um, all around the world, and I have a team, and they're not all from the same area or the same salon. So I work with stylists all over the U.S. that are on on my traveling education, and I fly them in, and we do team training a couple times a year. And so the cool thing about that is I get to work with a very diverse group of people not only um, diverse in terms of their location, but also age group as well and their specialties. So I work with texture specialists, platinum specialists, vivid specialists. I also work with people from 50s down into their 20s. So I see the challenges within each generation. And the thing is, is different generations have different advantages, right? So the previous hierarchy has a lot of advantage to the traditional academy, right? So we had the access to the Sassoons and to the Tonian guys, and we had the access to the foundation of the knowledge. That's harder to get now, honestly, because the thing is, if you're a a phenomenal educator, why would you want to go work for an academy that's going to pay you, I don't know, 60000 a year, let's say, for example, when you know you can go sell out a class and make, you know, 30000 or something in, within a weekend? So the top educators now, of course, they're going to go independent because they're going to chase the money. So it's difficult because you don't have all the education within that one branch. So you really do have to go and take this class and this class and this class. And again, there's no vetting. So who's a great educator and who's not is to be seen. Again, the cream is now rising to the top and we do have to get that word of mouth referral because you can see someone on Instagram and it can be flashy and it could be great, but then you get there in person and you find out, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) it's good to make sure that you get the, you get the referral and make sure that the education is good. And that's honestly the reason why I've built because everything that I've taught, they're like, oh my God, now come here, come here, come here. And I've been able to grow organically rather than being blown up because listen, I'm not BTC team. I'm not cause prof team. I've done everything on my own because of the word of mouth piece of it. But the other thing that I want to say is I collaborate with the younger generation. So we were just talking earlier about my team member, Juan Carlos. He's in his twenties. He's only been in the industry for three years and he's already, you know, teaching his own classes and he's um, sponsored. But the thing is, is we've traded the generational knowledge. So he came in and was like, what are you doing? That's not how you do a video. Oh, no, let me show you how to do this. I mean, no, 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 Ashley, no, come on. <laughs> and like, so he's taught me all about how to use the technology piece and really upped my game on that. And in turn, I've invested back in him. So I think the thing is, is like, it, it is really hard because – Again, that whole losing the position from the old hierarchy was super painful. And people are still experiencing that. Like even now, like when I work with a brand, for example, they'll have their artistic team and then they have their digital team. And they'll put me in the digital side. And I'm like, wait, why are we segregated like this? 
because we have something to trade here. You're you've made the you've made this artistic team go through all of these step by step processes, and you've tested them out to make sure they know their theory, to make sure they know their product knowledge within this brand that we're sponsored by. Yeah, we're over here. We have the EMV, which is the estimated social media value, and we're the ones giving you the free marketing dollars with our posts. But that doesn't mean that we necessarily know everything that's in this product. And so why can't we, why can't we work together? Why can't why can't we as a team like listen, you put me on game and let's make sure we're on the same team and make sure that we're like training each other. Hey, you want to learn how to make a a reel? I'll show you how to do that. You know, but if you want to teach me about the product knowledge on this, so when I'm teaching in person, I actually know how to answer the technical questions. So I think it's important for the generations to to work together more collaboratively. And I think it's important for us to to not have so much animosity. Yes, is there a lot of kids coming out of school that think that they can just get on Instagram and be all that in a bag of chips and they don't have to go through it. Of course, you're going to have that. So you're going to have to find the person that's hungry. And for me, it wasn't within one location. It wasn't in with one city. Like I've had to collect people from all around. And you will find people that share your value system. So once you set that value system, then you can create that collaborative effort. And then that goes into creating the community on your, on online. Not everyone's for you and that's okay, but you have to find the people that are, and you'll find the people that are super passionate. But this is the thing that I really, really learned within this last year working with my team. It's not just enough to be passionate about your craft. There's a lot of people that are passionate and love doing hair, but there's not a lot of people who are compassionate. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is like, they don't think about the fact that they're serving human beings. You know, they want to be flashy. They want to serve their ego. They want to do hair that just looks good for this one photo, but they don't think about how it's going to wear. They don't think how it's going to wash. And And yes, you can get away with that for a time, but when it comes to the cream rising to the top, listen, your relationships is what's going to get you farther. If you don't have advocates in your corner, guess what? Someone's going to be telling somebody and then karma's a bitch. So Mm -hmm. the thing that I've really realized is sometimes the people that are are really doing well are doing well because they're likable. Like, it seems like a weird secret to have, but it's true. And I'm going back to Germany um, in two weeks. And the crazy part is, is I had this gorgeous model there for color crafters. And I was like three months postpartum. And I was just kind of, I mean, jet lagged and pumping every three hours. It was like, I was like, I didn't even think I was going to make it to this trip. In fact, my husband was the one who was like, no, you need to go. Like I had originally turned the opportunity down. But he was like, you know what, if you don't go, like, not only do I support you, not only will I'll stay home and and watch these three kids, including this three month old baby. He's like, but if you don't go, you'll be wasting my sacrifice for me quitting my career. And I was like, wow, okay. Oh, that's deep. Yeah. So I was like, Talk okay. about a slap in the yeah. face. Bro. I mean, it was like, okay. No pressure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was so sweet because he he drove me to the airport at like three o'clock in the morning and played um, that that song, Golden Hours. Like, this is your golden hour. Like, you don't need sun to shine. Like, it was so sweet. I was like, theory. <laughs> so I went and did this, this model and this model was like, oh my God, she looks like the next Cindy Crawford. I mean, just, and she was so nervous nervous because all the other models were getting their consultations with the influencers and the influencers are well like, well, this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to show. And this is what we want to create for the thing. And so we actually had models that didn't show up the next day Mm, because they were like, Ooh, no. But with her, I was like, I treated her like a client, like a human being. And I was like, like, let's have a real consultation. And that's actually something I, I learned too, from this one, um, one of my mentors, Gianni Scumacci, who was one of the first he was the youngest creative director of the London Vidasa soon. Pre-COVID, I actually paid. It was a, by the time I paid for a flight and hotel and the cost of this class, it was like a ten thousand dollar investment to oh. go and do this private class with him. And the thing that I learned more from him than anything, not even doing hair, was his philosophy about doing hair. He has this philosophy called heart to hand, and it's about this fact that your hands respond to your heartbeat. And so, if your heart isn't right, then your hands can't even perform. And so it's about getting this right to get this right. And so it's really cool. And he talked about his most famous haircut he ever did called the fanny. And it was so famous that it was a, it was a um, question on the British Jeopardy. It was like, what is the fanny? Kind of like, what is the Rachel haircut in the U S for example? That's how famous it was. And he said the thing that the, that was the key to it was the consultation. 
because he sat down, he talked to this model, and he was in charge of basically giving these models a look. So when these young girls come in and they're in the model agency and they are trying to like kind of find their way and find their look and their signature, they send them off. They were sending them off to Gianni Scamacci to help them figure out what their look was going to be. And so he said the first time that he met this girl, Fanny, she was super young. And he was like, you know what? She's not ready. And he actually sent her away. And then years later, a couple years later, she comes back and he he realizes like the way she's sitting, her attitude, that she was more of like just a tomboy, like skater girl. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know what? Like, wh- how would you feel about like shaving this side of the head like this? And like he did this whole undercut, and this was in the '90s, so this right. was like one of the original undercuts, you know, that came became so popular and made it such a big trend, and. That's why it got so famous. And so he told me that the thing is, is you have to understand if you want to do something original, realize that you have an individual in your chair. So if you want to be original, all you have to do is speak to that individual and bring out the best in them. And so that's what I did. I had a real conversation with this model, a real consultation. And I sat down, she showed me her phone photos. We got off the level finder, we wrote everything down and I you know, tried to talk her through piece by piece and we filmed it step by step. And the whole time I just treated her like my baby. And that's funny because my very first mentor told me your client is like your baby. And before you have kids, you don't understand what that means. <laughs> and then when you have a baby, you're like, oh, like they literally cannot do anything for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it means you wipe their ass. Right. So literally, you know, I didn't wipe her ass, but <laughs> everything besides that, I took care of her. Like right. I c- took care of her because I understood there's these different levels of models and the hair models are typically at a lower level because there's more flexibility as to what you can do to their hair. But these higher echelon models, there's more restrictions and actually they have cards like in their card of the model, the, the, the actual model contract tells you what you can and can't do to their hair. Mm. So their agencies have so much control over their look. And they can't change it too much because they have a consistent body of work right. that is like their calling card. So she's super nervous because she's like one of these upper echelon models that really can't change much. And she wanted to come to me because she saw my work was a little bit more commercial, like the butterfly haircut mm-hmm. and more of like a lived in balayage kind of look. And so I did this butterfly haircut and this foilage on her. She was so freaking happy. And as I was like, I was filming her reaction as I was like taking out her curls and brushing it out. And that's actually ended up what ended up making the content go viral was really just the reaction from her, but it was genuine. And so um, long story short, that video is now nominated in top 100 color video for this year for BTC and one shot. So cross fingers. And she loves her hair so much. She's been booking so many jobs that she only wants me to do her hair So I did her hair in October, and now I'm going to be there in two weeks, and I happen to have a little bit of extra time to retouch her hair. So all that to kind of go back to this whole thing about, like, it's really about the not just the passion, but the compassion and how you treat people, because that's who you're serving. And then if you extend that compassion to your virtual audience and understand that that online community is a reflection of your actual community, then you realize that the relationships is not about social climbing. It's not about using people and stepping on people to get to the top because that foundation is not solid. That's going to fall in the long run. And also, too, where are you going to be when you're like, you know, 70 years old and you're retired at Christmas Day and no one's calling and you're lonely? <laughs> Personally, I would rather be around, you know, a, my family with a house full of grandkids and still married to my high school sweetheart and still have team members that call me or send me a text just – because I didn't treat them like shit. And I didn't think I was all that in a bag of chips. And I didn't need to be like, oh, not this Uber because it's not an Uber block. Because listen, I've been around that. You know, it's a game. So the the in-person relationships is so important because that's the foundation of everything that's reflected onto the social media piece. Nice. That was a long answer. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> hold, hold, on, hold on. I hope this is the right one. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Standing ovation. <laughs> that was satisfying. That was satisfying. Yes, that's amazing. It's amazing how like how effortless your storytelling is. 
Yeah, I was going to say it's like uh, you have the perfect combination of hashtag best life, hashtag real life. I, I feel like it's either one or the other. She just did a post about that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. She did a post Instagram about Instagram versus life real. versus real life. It was it was awesome. She had like I don't know some contraption like you know hooked up to her. It was and, my uh, breast pump. It was yeah. definitely your breast pump. <laughs> yeah. She was looking like stellar, and then the next picture is like her like I know, you know like unposed. I know. You know. That was my husband taking a picture of me because I'm like walking around the house with my like breast pump pumped in, like strapped in. And he was like, you look ridiculous and took a picture <laughs> and showed me. That's and I was like, do. oh my God, I don't even want to see that photo. I don't even want to see it, but here, I'll post it to 200. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, did, it did take me a couple months before I was like, I warmed up to that photo. And then I was like, you know what? Actually, that girl's a bad bitch right there. I'm that proud is. of her for getting through 11 months of breastfeeding the third time in a row. Shit. That was not easy. I was actually going to bring it up earlier when you're talking about your post just like how how cool that is because i'm um, you're talking about mothers and stuff and like and like you said that you need to step into that and and i thought that that post was so incredible was great because of that like like you're advocating not just ashley norman that we see today looking beautiful but also ashley norman at home like yeah this is this is the not, i don't want to use the word the struggle but but this is just real life yeah you know we can all put on makeup we can all look pretty but yeah. this is real life this is what this is what really happens and all the other stuff is the facade now i'm also a big fan of like you know you hear people talk about um i want real i want real life I want, and i'm like i'm okay with like the food pictures now you know, I'm okay with like, I'm okay, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with like people showing me their best life because I want their best life. I don't want their worst life. Like if I'm like, if I'm using it as some kind of inspiration in my life, I don't, you know, I don't want the, 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 if people post about fighting with their spouse or that, that the stuff that's going to like that. I don't want that in my space. What I want is that is I want to see, I want to see Ashley on stage and, 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 and it, it, it's 10 deep outside the door. Like that, <laughs> that to me is cool. Like, like. She's doing something. Yeah. You know, like this conversation relates to talking about the younger generation stylists getting since you represent it. Yes. Representative here. Yes. Tell Um, us about it. (laughs) Yes. Well, I think how this relates to that conversation is like, I think a lot of younger stylists get into it and they see this perfect picture Mm. on social media. Mm. Right. And I think that educators, influencers in those types of spaces, being vulnerable and speaking about how difficult things can be sometimes, you know, and how like real life comes about within within this industry for people, I think can really help with making that younger generation really understand totally. what exactly they're getting themselves into, you know. Yeah, yeah I totally believe that. I think we this came up earlier this week on the podcast too, and um, I don't know if it's going to derail us or not, but we'll get into it. And Gary V talks about it as well. Is I mean, if he says it, it's got to be <laughs> right. Gary V's the man. But um, but like with AI taking up a, such a big space, or certainly in the future, that 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 the only currency that we're going to have is authenticity. Absolutely. You know that that's what's going to break through. It's going to be the authenticity because everything else that just looks is probably going to be AI generated. So what's going to what's going to come through authenticity is is always going to come through. You know, I have uh, interview teachers that work at like hair schools and um, and like people who run the schools and. They say things like, and I feel like this plays into what both of you are saying, uh, like, um, these kids don't think that I clean bathrooms. They think I'm lying to them. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, these kids don't think I trained for, but if I, if I say I trained for a year or more, then they say, well, you're just old and uh, you don't have access to as much information. So they're like, I don't need to train, you know? And it's like, and then they're seeing this content online that doesn't explain how people got to where they went, needed to be, and then they don't talk about, you know, real stuff. And that's kind of why I like uh, what you're, how you're talking about, like, you're, you're definitely saying, yes, you can have everything you want, but you're also keeping it real. And I think that that is what we need personally. Yeah. And then also the in-person education is so important. And so like when I go in like deep with the theory piece of it and I'm like, what's the pH of this and what's that? And what's the alkalizer of this? And what's the difference between this and this and that? They're just like, like, so Mm -hmm. you got to like, sometimes like when they go to the real education, that's when they get a little bit humbled. But I mean, honestly, in a beauty school, what do they say the percentage of people who actually go to school and the people who actually enter the the industry, you know? So it's true. You're going to have this crop that's not going to make it. But I also think like we haven't really even talked about the other, the flip side of it, which is the older generation. So I have team members that are in their 50s on my team and they're crushing it. One of my team members, her name's Christine Carver and her Instagram is Lighten Up the World. And she's a platinum specialist and she lives in Henderson, North Carolina. So I say that because Hendersonville is outside of Asheville, outside of Charlotte. So it's like the suburbs of the suburbs. And she's originally from New York and LA. And she was actually a 
fashion designer. She went to fit them and she worked for guests. She traveled the world. And then she ended up with the wrong guy. Like things happened in LA and became a single mom and had to move back in with her parents when she was turning 40 with her daughter. And she basically had to start out from scratch, like had nothing, went to beauty school. And so now that became her second career. She's actually remarried now to a Southern gentleman. (laughs) (laughs) And I met her about five years ago because she had a salon and she was struggling to learn about balayage. And I was pregnant with my first child who's now seven and I was traveling and teaching and I taught a class in New York and she drove and took my education and then she continued to follow me after that. And I was looking for an assistant when I had left my salon and she was like, Hey, I know that, you know, I'm in North Carolina and you're in California, but what do you think about you letting me travel with you as your traveling assistant? And then you can mentor me. And I said, okay, well, let me pray about it. And then I ended up saying, yeah, let's do it. So she started traveling with me every other weekend on the road. We would meet up in whatever city I was teaching in. And it was really cool because we were both kind of going through stuff and we both like really confided in each other and grew a lot. She had literally no following on social media back then. Within five years, she's now got 10,000 followers. And now she's a sponsored artist with F18 as well. And she's now teaching and traveling platinum classes. She's also teach charging like over $100, like $150 an hour, specializing in color corrections and platinums. And she has people flying and driving in to see her. So she's 53 now and she's hot as shit. We go out to a bar and people think she's my sister. <laughs> but it's like, it just to say that like it doesn't matter what generation that you're in, it, you know, she she put in the work when it comes to coming and traveling with me and it's listen it's not easy on the road it is really not especially the way I do education because I don't just come in and do a four hour demo fluffy class like it is like theory it is hands on it is live model demonstration we get to the salon at eight o'clock in the morning we don't leave till eight p.m. At the earliest. I remember getting kicked out of a salon because I was like, and then you take the picture like this and then like that. And then they're like, oh, and now they just want a social media class. I'm like, yeah. And I'm over here like eight months pregnant, still teaching. I'm like, keep up. But (laughs) the point is, it's like, it's a lot of work. And she did travel with me and she's made those connections over time. And it wasn't like she was using me on my platform. But again, we are trading. So if you're, it it doesn't matter if you find the community that has that like-minded passion and compassion for the craft, like you're going to get where you want to be and you have to define that where it is that you want to be. Not everybody wants to be an educator. Some people just want to be successful behind the chair, but you have to look for that mentorship and going back to AI, it's like, yeah, the computer can create a better image than any human can create. So we're no longer just going to celebrate art for art's sake. And if you, you could even argue that these hair shows that celebrate strictly technical skill that's not really practical. It's so avant-garde that no one's even going to wear their hair like that. Like that becomes its own little world. And the only people who really care about her are in that little world. Right. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like what are we doing and what validates our craft? Are we pleasing the client? That's really what validates it at the end of the day. And so there has to be that reality in the relationship. So yeah, a computer can't recreate the human connection. And so you're, like you said, the, the reality of that and the compassion of that is going to be our currency. And if you look at like any movie that has to do with AI and what happens at the end of AI is like the computer decides that humanity is evil. And so therefore let's <laughs> kill them all. Right. Like if you're looking at like Terminator and now there's that new weird Annabelle movie. Creepy. I don't, I didn't watch it. <laughs> I can't watch that stuff because I have kids. And so anything involving children, I no. Oh, yeah, yeah. But like the whole point is, is like the computer always ends up concluding that, you know, you know, end all life. And so if you go back to like bottom of the line, good and evil, anything religious, like God versus the devil, like that's what the devil concludes, end all life. And so if you're looking at the flip side of it, of like God saying like, no, life has a value. So when it comes down to it, it, whatever you put into the computer is what you're going to get out of it. So you're computing that. So you have to input the morality. You have to input the morality. And so that's what I mean about the the team and the relationships and the value system. You have to input the morality and input the value system because that's what you're going to get out of it. And that's what a computer cannot have because a computer doesn't know right from wrong. So if we, if we step away from that, then that's what we're going to lose. And then, yeah, we're not going to be any better than a computer and a, and a computer will compete and it will win. hundred percent. Mm. <laughs> Mm. 
That's awesome. I know you had a hard stop and we've gone over a hard stop a little bit, but, but I, I can't thank you enough. Um, um, I, I think, uh, I'm going to bother you every premiere because you just, <laughs> you lighten me up so much. Like, oh, like, you. like I get fired up t listening to you. And, and, and again, just your way of articulating is just so beautiful. When you were talking about like the old, the old hierarchy and the way you explain that, I've been explaining that for years, but never, never, never as articulately as, as, as you did. And, and I'm, definitely stealing everything that you said about that because because you're spot on with that and it was just like so beautifully uh, explained thank you so much Th yeah, thanks for hanging out robbie thank you for being here thanks for hunter thanks me. for sitting yeah. in with us um pleasure. It, yeah. thank you for uh, being our token uh, uh zier yeah token z he's our token <laughs> he's our token z <laughs> i'd like to like i'd like to hope that i'm a zillennial a little Ooh. bit I'm like two years away from being a i've millennial. never heard that he's a zillennial a zillennial yeah. <laughs> so I don't have the full like Gen Z jaded. Yeah, and he doesn't wear pajamas. Clearly, <laughs> look at his outfit. <laughs> <laughs> True Gen Z can't even get out of their pajamas. So. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. All right, once again, we'll start again. Ravi, Ashley, Hunty, thank you very, very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.